Hey everyone, 2022 here. I want to close off the year with some summary of the year and then also some of my top 10 recommendation books of this year. So this year I've read 207 books which consists of 69, nice, 69,782 pages. Most of the book I read are reflective and the least book I read is hopeful which a little bit boring but I'm fine. Most of the book I read is under 300 but there are still a few books. I've read 13 books that have more than 500 pages and then 20% of the book that I've read is non-fiction. Most of the book I read, uh, let's face it, is manga. I think that's why there's <laughs> 200 books that I've read because 50 or 60 of them that are basically just manga. So yes, that was, that's the book I've read this year. The more I read, the more I'm amazed at how much people have misidentified confidence with having very strong opinion about everything while conveniently forgetting that empty barrel makes the most noises. Added with a clickbait news cycle where news, articles, and social media contents have to be delivered and received like viral news is the only happening and every information needs to be dumbed down so much into short contents. Just because we have a lot of something to say about certain topics doesn't mean we're not ignorant on it. Instead of comfortably parking in the ignorant side of Dunning-Kruger and having a gaping hole where knowledge and understanding should have been, read books and learn from them. Read fiction if non-fiction are too daunting for you. Some fiction have more to say compared to certain non-fiction life, self-help books. Of course, reading just for the sake of reading itself is not as useful, even epic it is said. Don't just say you have read book. Show that through them you have learned to think better, to be a more discriminating and reflective person. Books are the training wakes of the mind. They are very helpful, but it would be a bad mistake to suppose that one has made progress simply by having internalized their contents. There are so much headspace for people to grow, and reading can help you to at least see how far the ceiling is. Now, without further ado, here is the 10 books of all the books I've read this year which left the most impression on me. Number 10 is Kim Ji Yoon, born 1982. It is a short book. Its shortness doesn't make it less impactful though. While mostly it told the story of Ji Yoon and the difficulties she had growing up as a female gender in South Korea. These experiences are so relatable, I actually have some flashback from what I've seen in person, but didn't recognize back then. This is a great book to read if you want to know more about what the experiences of being treated as mere womb on legs can be. This book, as the meme goes, says a lot about society. The world had changed a great deal, but the little rules, contracts, and custom has not, which meant the world hasn't actually changed at all. Number 9 is Nobody's Normal. Speaking of a lack of knowledge and understanding, mental health is a topic that I've been invested on a long time. It's such an interesting topic that it's often used in movies or series, although they're either badly or wrongly depicted. It is such an interesting topic that a lot of people seem to want to speak their opinion on it as uneducated as they are. A lot of these people are too lazy to read and too narcissistic to hold their tongue. As a result, they become the kind of people that seem like they like to suck on their own opinion a bit too much. This book is not the end all be all of this vast field of knowledge, but it is a really good start if you don't want to turn into the kind of person that I just described. It is a really good historical progress of the field itself, with a lot of names that are familiar to the progress that we've made on this topic. So that if you're not equipped enough to help or equipped enough to sympathize, at least you're equipped enough with some knowledge. Using the vocabulary of mental illness validates the growing acceptance that mental illnesses are a matter of spectrum. More importantly, speaking this more freely disarms the stigma of those illness labels by making them a part of the general human conditions. Number 8 is My Dark Vanessa. I didn't give this book a 5 star after reading it, and even now I still didn't give it a 5 star. My Dark Vanessa tells a realistic story about grooming where a teacher manipulates the girl he teaches in such a way. 
It is such an uncomfortable book to read, and I feel dirty almost every single moment while reading this book. The writing is so well done, the characters, the story, and since it is so believable, it makes going through the book much harder. But if any fiction I read this year can be defined as essential reading, it's this one. I can lose the thing I've held onto for so long, you know. My face twists up from the pain of pushing it out. I really need it to be a love story, you know. I really, really need it to be that. I know, she says. Because if it isn't a love story, then what is it? I look to her glassy eyes. Her face of wide open sympathy. It's my life, I say. This has been my whole life. Number seven, it's a little life. One of the most profoundly sad books I've ever read, and not just this year. That every time I want to mention it, I had to give a warning to look for the trigger warnings, plural, of the book. While it is easy to demean Hanya Yanagihara's work by saying it's just torture porn because it is if you only look at the hard part to read, but I don't think that's all it is. There is so much thematic layer on this story that place it above books that can be defined to those disregard. But only read it if you're in a space where you can read the book. I don't agree with shying away from certain emotion too much or it will bite you when it eventually can. This book is the kind of book that will stay with you even when you're done with it. And that's for me something beautiful and empowering in that itself. Why wasn't friendship as good as a relationship? Why wasn't it even better? It was two people who remained together day after day, bound not by sex or physical attraction or money or children or property but only by the shared agreement to keep going, the mutual decision to a union that could never be codified. Number 6 is the book of emptiness and form. Number 6 is the book of emptiness and form. This book won Woman Fiction Award of 2022 and for a good reason. It's one of those books that the concept of the story is as ambitious as it is so well de- executed. Annabelle the mother and Benny the son make for such an amazing duo. How they handle grief mirror each other so much, Annabelle is comforted by the items and those items cause Benny to suffer. It's amazing how the two of them, mother and son, could be so much of an opposite despite living together and coping with the same death of their loved one. And the book is narrated by a book, or does it? The ending feels a bit rush, but it is still genuinely one of the books that really stick out for me this year. Every book is trapped in their own particular bubble of delusion, and it's every person task in life to break free. Books can help. We can make the past into the present, take you back in time and help you remember. We can show you things, shift your realities and widen your world. But the work of walking, waking up is up to you. Number five is Hamnet. Hamnet is a masterpiece of storytelling. Every word seems to be placed on purpose like a puzzle that you can see the seams is the story of Shakespeare's family, but Shakespeare himself is never mentioned by name. So we automatically focus more on Agnes and her family and children. The writing is so beautiful and captivating that you paid more attention to the story. As a result, when the impending tragedy happened, you feel the grief of Agnes as she lost her son Hamnet. It is a tragedy for the ages and one that I believe will be remembered as a classic. She, like all mothers, constantly casts out her talks, like fishing line, toward her children, reminding herself of where they are, what they are doing, how they fare. From habit, while she sits there near the fireplace, some part of her mind is tabulating them and their whereabouts. Judith upstairs, Susanna next door, and Hamlet, her unconscious mind casts, again and again, puzzled by the lack of bite, by the answer she keeps giving it. He is dead. He is gone. Number four is Man Called Oof. As soon as I finished the book, I already missed the characters of the story. And even now, I still remember them vividly. A story about a grumpy old man, a stickler for the rules, and a heart of gold. I honestly think just like everybody have a favorite movie or music that they rewatch or re-listen most often, this is someone's favorite book. It is definitely one of my favorite story I read this year, and one that I will reread again when I need a heartwarming story. 
it is so wholesome that I feel like my heart want to leap out from my body and be its own person. I love this book to bits and pieces, and I hope you will too. To love someone is like moving into a house, Sonja used to say. At first, you fall in love in everything new, you wonder every morning that this is one's own. As if they are afraid that someone will suddenly come tumbling through the door and say that there have been a serious mistake and that it simply was not meant to live so fine. But as the years go by, the fake get warm, the wood cracks here and there, and you start to love this house not so much for all the ways it is perfect, in that for all the ways it is not. You become familiar with all its nooks and crannies, how to avoid that the key gets stuck in the lock if it's cold outside, which floorboards have some give when you step on them, and exactly how to open the doors for them not to creak. There is all the secret secret that make it your home. Number three is a silent voice. Sometimes in your life you encounter a story that you know is made by people who cares about its story, its characters, the theme, and the world they live in. The Truman Show, Shawshank Redemption, Dark, and much more are some series of the top of my mind that can be described as this, and so is a silent voice. Each of its complex characters are captured and shown in a way where you can see why they did what they did. A story where if you point as a character, as a villain, you might point to someone that you know in your life. You can sympathize with them even if you don't excuse what they did. A silent voice is one of the best stories to learn what it means to sympathize. Things would have been so much better back then. If we had heard each other's voices, I hate myself, I was selfish. I never talk about anyone else's feeling. Since then, my classmates have all looked down on me. I've lived for 17 years, and I haven't lived one of them as a good person. And number two is the seventh husband of Evelyn Hugo. I think this book is big entertainment. This book will definitely get adapted to a movie which can possibly flop. So you might want to read this before that, just as a preventative for missing such a good story. And the best part is that all of Taylor Jenkins' read book after Seven Husband of Evelyn Hugo is just as good and they're all connected. I honestly can fill this top 10 list with some of her book if I choose to. She has somehow managed to capture the glamour and charm of celebrity life that still captivates people around the world today, but tells them in such a realistic way that makes her characters still grounded and believable characters. There are also a lot of lessons that can be learned from her writing that goes toe to toe with how entertaining they are. A great writer once inspired me to be more responsible when he writes, with great power comes great responsibility. And Taylor Jenkins Read Story has a lot of those layers. And taking pride in your beauty is a damning act because you allow yourself to believe that the only thing notable about yourself is something with a very short shelf life. And number one, is woman and gender in Islam. Religion as a topic itself has been politicized to no end that it is usually really hard to find a book that are accurate and critical but also not antagonizing. Leila Ahmed, a devout Muslim and an overall badass person, have wrote one of the best books on feminism on her culture and belief. Her writing are detailed, well-researched, analytical, nuanced, and beautiful. Even if you don't have the same belief as her, read this if not just because of how sad it is that in 2022, this book written in 1992 is still as relevant and important. Read this book and see the women who are still trying to shake the world awake in the most difficult places in 2022. They are some of the most inspiring human beings ever. Perhaps feminism could formulate some set of criteria for exploring issues of women in other cultures including Islamic society's criteria that they will undercut even inadvertent complicity in serving Western interests, but that, at the same time, would neither set limits on the freedom to question and explore nor in any way compromise feminism, passion, and commitment to the realization of societies that enable women to pursue without impediment the full development of their capacities and to contribute to their societies in all domains. Of course, there are more than just those 10 books that are really great books that I read this year, but I think most people won't have the time or patience or the means to read that much book. So I tried to be cutthroat in this selection and only choose 10 of them. 
hopefully you found something that piqued your interest here and that's about it yeah have a good 2023